Hi, it's uh, Paul Beck with Back. So, I was talking about uh, simple rules uh, governing sea ice uh, melt ponds, and it's just really a statistical process. Uh, like it's like it's like sand grains on a beach. If you measure the size, you're going to get a distribution, and you're going to get a lot more of the smaller particles and much much fewer of the larger particles. Same thing with uh, you know uh, meteorites or asteroids hitting the Earth right you're going to get mostly really really tiny ones huge numbers of those and as you go to the bigger ones and bigger ones and bigger ones thankfully you get fewer and fewer of those simply because there's fewer than fewer of those out in space so it follows this uh, so-called power distribution law so you get the same sort of thing with these melt ponds um, whether it be in the you know arctic or antarctic um, and there's something called a so so when they're t small uh, there's something called the percolation threshold. So if this parameter is at the percolation threshold, it's where you get a lot of these melt ponds starting to join for the first time. And if you go above that threshold, then you get a lot of different channels and stuff um, through the ice and, and the connected, connected melt ponds. And if you're lower than this threshold, then you get all separate, um, separate smaller melt ponds scattered all around. Um, so this percolation threshold is about 30 percent, 0 0.3. Um, so when the coverage uh, fraction of the sea ice is about 30 percent melt ponds, that's this percolation threshold. So, so the data um, was measured over many, many different years and it showed a remarkable similarity um, from year to year, uh, which was surprising. Um, but the uh, ponds were nearly, the, the, they, they basically were, the, the, the um, ratio varied between 27% and 32%. So it, it, was, it, it, it straddled that percolation threshold I talked about of 30%. So when you have 30% of the sea ice covered with melt ponds, they have this, uh, they're at this so-called percolation threshold of the theory. And uh, you know, the, the, the sea ice preferentially likes to have that sort of number and then if you get more than that you get the channels and then you get the ice breaking up and so on if you get less than that it's spotted and of course it's very important to know these things because it determines the albedo of the ice uh, reflectivity of the ice because the, the ponds are absorb much more sunlight they're much more absorbing the albedo is much much lower than that of the of the sea ice that they're on Okay, so you get these uh, clusterings, and so there's this is modeled in the, there's different models and smoothings and stuff, and it works great. And uh, you know we have a good prediction of what it is, and we can get the albedo fairly well. There was um, some additional work on Antarctic sea ice. Um, you know the snow melt processes on the sea ice, um, and uh, you know the passive microwave observations from the satellite. Um, as the ice, like, w were looked at over season, so October, November, December, so as, this is Antarctica, so we're going into the Antarctic summer, so as the ice is melting, the signal, the temperature signal is looked at, and the trends are looked at. You can see when the, when the snow melt onset dates are, and you can see how much water is percolating down through the snow. Um, depending on the on the frequencies of the signals that you're looking at, some of them penetrate the ice a lot. So you get the sun coming in, it penetrates the ice, and, and you get a signal not just from the surface of the ice, but from within the ice. So you can actually study, uh, you know, look at snow depth penetration and see, look, you can actually see snow melt within the snow column from the satellite, not just the surface. Um, there were talks on the rheology, if you like, the mechanical and deformation of sea ice using different models. So sea ice is a granular material, there's different shear zones, it's got different strengths, there's different sizes. Um, so you can sort of model it and see how it jams up. So what sizes mesh together and jam up. So the shear stress, if you like, um, you know, it, 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 there's a peak value. So the, as the ice is getting fractured, there's a, there's a value of fracture. That's, there's a peak strength, if you like, and then it drops off. 
Um, and uh, so this is important for seeing how the ice moves and how it gets stuck on coastlines and shores and how you get ice bridges forming over time. So we used to always have an ice bridge on the nearest strait and that kind of kept a lot of the sea ice from going through and now that ice bridge goes and uh, you know there is some interest in perhaps you know could we actually make an ice bridge, you know, do sea ice thickening in that particular region to jam up the ice to stop it going out through the strait. Um, and, uh, you know, there's that type of thing. Um, I, I, I went to some talks to see how climate change was affecting the global food supply. There was a George Monbiot in The Guardian wrote an article about U.S. farming a couple of weeks ago or during the AGU. He's talking about uh, thing you know we're flogging the land to death was was a term he used in the article so there's different data on yields um, there's something called the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center S-E-S-Y-N-C how's that for an acronym um, and uh, it looks at county data yields yields from different uh, for different crops on county data in the US and it tries, to, and then you, get, you have climate data, and it tries to look at how climate, you know, how climate, the climate data is changing, how that's affecting the yield data. The problem is there's a scalar mismatch. The, the resolution of the data is on much different scales. So, so you, you, you have to try to figure out how to get around that. Um, the bottom line is, you know, we know that there's, the yield plummets uh, when you cross a threshold. So, maize, for example, wheat, soy, whatever, um, you know, 30 degrees Celsius maybe, and then yields plummet after that. It also depends on precipitation, uh, soil moisture, things like that. So that's all looked at in these different studies. Um, there was a more localized study in the Southeast USA. They produce 17% of the US crops. Um, that's in the USDA census from 2012. So trying to see how those yields are changing under different uh, climate models, under RCP 4.5, 8.5 scenarios. 10 global climate models were used to look at it. And uh, basically growing season was looked at, you know, how long it takes from when you sow the uh, crops to, uh, to, to when they, when you sow the seeds to when they start growing and then when they start growing to maturity those sort of times are switching um, maize is decreasing for example in the summers because it's too hot and too dry but of course winter wheat is uh, yields are increasing because winter temperatures are higher um, so there's a bit of a balance there but the the loss in the summer crop exceeds that of the gain in the winter crop, so the net effect is is a drop in yields. So uh, this is a huge problem. We only have so much land uh, to grow stuff, so uh, you know, food supply is going to be a, a big issue, um, you know, especially under the mid to high uh, RCP uh, temperature ranges. Um, I went to sessions on risk assessment of natural hazards. There was, of course, you know, this was in New Orleans. We had Katrina in, in, in uh, 2012, actually, sorry, 2005, Katrina. Uh, Sandy was, I was thinking of Sandy. 2005, Katrina, um, the place I stayed, the motel I stayed at was eight feet underwater, as well as that entire region. You could still see watermarks on some of the buildings. There was still graffiti on some of the buildings and stuff like that. So, you know, so natural hazards um, are obviously a, a big deal, you know, in, in many cities, uh, including New Orleans. Um, so there were a lot of social science talks on so-called wicked problems. You know, what are wicked problems versus tame problems? Um, so this is very important in, in risk assessment, right? So when we, how we define wicked problems are they're messy, they're ill-defined, there's lots of levels of complexity, um, and they don't have obvious solutions. There's lots of connections between things happening, um, and you can't use simplistic approaches to deal with them or to model, with them, model them ahead of time. So 
Um, it's very important that we assess what we know, what we don't know, and what we think we know, but we don't really know. So this was a talk um, by, very interesting talk by USGS, the US Geological Society, Kenneth Hudnett, who, okay, so, so they took, uh, this was on earthquakes, so they looked at the Hayward Fault, because nobody thinks too much about the Hayward Fault. But the Hayward Fault cuts right through San Francisco. It cuts right through Silicon Valley. It's among the most urbanized fault in the U.S. You know, everybody talks, thinks California, San Andreas, but the, the Hayward Fault um, is, is a huge risk that is just not being assessed. So the question is, you know, what would happen if there was not an enormous earthquake, but just like a seven, a, an earthquake, seven magnitude, 7.0, um, what would happen if, if it hit that fault? You know, it, the speed of the shock wave would be 7,000 miles an hour. It would spread along this fault um, for a large distance. It would take about 30 seconds. It would so be about a 30 second quake. Um, so they modeled this scenario. They called it, uh, they called it haywired, um, the, the haywired fault. So they had a whole bunch of different scenarios. They had the shakeout for the San Andreas quake um, different winter storms, tsunamis, summer storms. So, uh, you know, the risk is highest where humans and hazards collide. Okay, this is the difference between, you know, disaster versus a catastrophe. So l risk reduction can save a lot of lives. Like, you know, after Katrina, for example, a third of the population left New Orleans and they didn't come back, they never came back. The buildings were, you know, dark, dark, just unoccupied. So you need to assess the risks across all different disciplines. You have the earth sciences, you know, how much shaking will there be? Will there be landslides? Will there be liquefaction? What, you know, what's gonna, then you have the engineering, you know, how, how what are the structures like? Are they gonna withstand the initial quake? Are they gonna catch fire afterward? How are people gonna get out of the regions and out of the buildings? How many people are in the different regions? You know, how does that relate to the soils underneath and so on? Then you have the socio, sort of social, uh, you know, higher order things about, you know, communities. How resilient is a community? You know, do, are the people, do they follow earthquake drills? Is this going to be totally new to them? Um, you know, what's it going to do to the internet? Is it going to wipe out all of the phone lines and connection lines and, and uh, Wi-Fi towers, et cetera? You know, what about the mental health of the people there afterwards, um, or, you know, people, and, and so on. So, and then you have the policy, you know, you want to integrate across all of these disciplines to see what would, what would happen. So, you know, because, you know, the aftershocks for something like this can, can be, uh, it can cost way more. You know, how many people will move away from, from the Bay Area if this, uh, if this fault hit? Um, how do we reduce risk? Um, so there's a, you can just go to Haywired, if you just Google haywired.us, okay, you can get all these different scenarios on this particular fault and on, uh, you know, what work is being done. And I think the anniversary of the San Francisco earthquake is coming up soon. Um, I guess the 1908 uh, earthquake, and it was the fire that took out most of San Francisco after the quake. So I think they they want to release the results of this scenario on the Hayward Fault uh, very very soon. Um, Eighty three kilometers or fifty two mile long fault line, and like I say, the most heavily urbanized region in the U.S. And it could take out um, lots of uh, Silicon Valley companies. And of course, we know um, about a third of the venture capital in the U.S. goes to Silicon Valley companies. So it would you know, it would, it would have huge economic impacts that really aren't, aren't really visible to most of the uh, public with that scenario. So, so this was a very interesting talk. Like I said, it's by Kenneth Hudnett, uh, USGS. Um, so, you know, it kind of, kind of sticks out for, for hazard planning. I mean, you can apply the results of this, um, some of the uh, models and scenarios from this to just about any any different, um, you know, city or town that you're in, you can change it to look at floods, you can change it to look at extreme weather events, uh, you know, things like that. Thank you.